disguised as the enemy who commit atrocities that are then blamed on the blamed on the enemy and then they slip out and it justifies the government in this case Museveni sending in his or sorry Museveni's yeah the Museveni government sending in his own troops or the Kagame government sending in his own troops and committing atrocities in Uganda in 1980 to 1986 Museveni's army committed atrocities and blamed them on the Ugandan government who was then persecuted by the American media Milton Obote persecuted by the American media committing a genocide claiming that the government of Uganda was committing all these atrocities that were actually being committed by Museveni in Rwanda it was the RPF committing the atrocities and blaming them on the Habyarimana government Habyarimana government was castigated as being and chastised as being responsible for genocide as early as 1992 by Alex DeWall Alex DeWall is seen all over the media you'll see him in all these policy journals and all these the 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 what's that mag newspaper out of Manhattan that's considered to be left an alternative the village voice for example you'll see Alex DeWall just saying whatever he wants and nobody questions it Alex DeWall and and uh, Human Rights Watch expert Alison De Forge started producing this story about genocide in Rwanda as early as 1992 and while the RPF was committing the bulk of the atrocities against the Hutu people, the Habyarimana government was being blamed for everything, and the Habyarimana government was being handcuffed, unable to do anything to protect themselves from an invasion of an aggressive force from an outside country backed by the United States, Israel, and Britain, for example. Predominantly, Israel, the United States, and Britain. There were two men at the front of this psychological and covert operation. Roger Winter, U.S. Committee of Refugees out of Washington, D.C., and, and uh, David Kimchi, a Mossad agent out of, out of Tel Aviv, out of Israel. These guys led and organized the RPF war machine as early as 1988 by producing propaganda in the United States that was distributed, which suggested and maintained the story that the Tutsis are the victims. They have a right to recover the state that's been taken from them. They have never mentioned the history of their oppression. They have never mentioned their assaults against Rwanda from 1972 until 1990. All of these invasions by the Tutsis where they marched in and tried to take the country. And, and, and instead, what they do was they, the media would always mention the backlash against the Tutsis. 100 Tutsis killed. doesn't mention that they invaded Rwanda. The Tutsis were set up as the victims from the beginning. They're always portrayed as the victims in this narrative. So there's the good people and the bad people. It's good versus evil. Tutsis versus Hutus. Whites versus blacks. I mean, it's, all of these themes can be unpacked from this. So as the RPF marched into Rwanda, they forced 2 million refugees into the capital city, Kigali by 1994. That weapons that were being shipped in were from the United States, they were from Uganda, they were from Britain. All kinds of powerful weaponry. Helicopters, for example. Rockets, surface-to-air missiles. Not just machetes, which are another story altogether. And then on April 6, 1994, the plane carrying the presidents of Rwanda and Burundi was shot down on approach to Kigali Airport after a meeting in Tanzania between Javier Mana and some of the other leaders of the region. President Mobutu found out about this meeting and found out that probably somebody was going to be killed, so he didn't go. And he lived. But he warned Javier Amana. But Javier Amana was still assassinated on April 6, 1994. The plane was shot down by the RPF, and this is the wreckage. There was never an investigation. It's been hidden from the world, blocked by the United States. What you saw in the New Yorker in January of this year was a claim by Philip Gurevich that there's been an investigation of a plane crash, and it turns out France did it. Gurevich was backed by the Pentagon in creating that story, but more importantly, he's selling the idea that France, who had supported Javier Mana from 1972, was responsible for genocide. Because the argument is always that France has a role in the genocide, and France played a part in that. You know, the United States citizens really don't like the French. There's a really heavy racism against France in the United States. But the bottom line is, France did support Javier Mana. They did support some nasty things in, in Uganda, I'm sorry, in Rwanda, just like in Gabon, in Central African Republic. The vast Francophone region of Africa that was controlled by France was being taken away from them by the United States, slowly but surely. And it has fallen into pieces, where the United States has taken pieces away from France, slowly but surely. And at another level, you've got France working with the United States to make sure that the raw materials come out and that the big money of the humanitarian sector is maintained. So Doctors Without Borders from the United States, Médecins Sans Frontières from France or from Belgium, etc., etc. France did send in some paratroopers in, in October of 1990. They helped fight off the uh, Rwandan Patriotic Front invasion and stall it. And then from 1990 to 1994, the Kagame machine, the war machine, went about these secretive maneuvers, always suing for peace. In other words, they would create 
a battle, they would do a bunch of killing, everything would be blamed by Human Rights Watch or African Rights on the government. The government would be forced to, uh, to, an ar to be held to an arms embargo. They couldn't enforce, in, import any arms, even though they were under attack and they were not prepared for a massive military uh, invasion. And the, and the RPF at the same time was being armed to the teeth by the United States in Israel and Britain through Uganda. The RPF had the support of Ethiopia and some Somalis as well during the invasion of, of Rwanda in 1994. And this is what the American media gave us. As if from April 6, 1994 to July 1994, it was absolute total butchery with no history. The Tutsis are the victims. They have no history of oppression. There was never any violence before 1994. It just exploded. It's a chas chasm of killing and bloodshed because that's what those tribes in Africa do. And the end of this story by Joshua Hammer again, again, I say he's a CIA agent, the end of this story, which isn't very long, just a bunch of nonsense propaganda, the bottom line is the best thing we can do is wait for the killing to subside and send in the humanitarian sector. That's what it says. The RPF was doing the killing. But you don't have to have, uh, all you've got to do is send in Gillis Paris who is one of these fancy magnum photographers, or send in James Natchway, who's coming behind the RPF lines and working with the RPF, who takes the pictures of the dead bodies. Now look at the decaying corpse. It's not dead today. It's been dead for a while. It's hard to tell with the lights on, but this is a dead, dead person that's been dead for a while. I don't see a stamp on his forehead that says, I'm a Tutsi, and I don't see him telling the person who's taking the photograph that he's a Tutsi. How do we know that's a Tutsi? The fact is, more people were killed were Hutus than Tutsis. And two professors, Davenport and Stam, have produced this fantastic project about this subject, which at the same time has some huge problems with it, because Davenport, turned out, was a former covert operations guy who has some real problems with his argument. But anyway, that show that there were not that many Tutsis, not 800,000 Tutsis in Rwanda at the time. Certainly not 1.2 million. So there's another decaying body that was, that was you know, labeled as a Tutsi. It quite very well could be a Tutsi. It quite very well could be a Twa or a Hutu as well. This imagery was used over and over. It's actually an art project by James Natchway and Gillis Paris. You know, some of these photographs have been reproduced over and over and over. The machetes. Some of the photographs of machetes that you'll see from 1994, after the RPF concluded the war in July, the machetes weren't in, from Rwanda. In other words, if, you, if the people, the Rwandans who study these pictures have told me these machetes were not Rwandan. They were not in Rwanda in 1994. But the machetes were piled up by the RPF and used as evidence to show the photographers of what those nasty Hutus did. So who did the killing that we actually see that created those people with the slices through their bodies and the butchery and the stuff that was real? The Interahamwe, the Force Army Rwanda, the Habyarimana Armed Forces were accused of genocide. The International Criminal Tribunal has never found for genocide against a single person from Rwanda in 16 years and they've spent billions. They didn't find genocide charges. They didn't find conspiracy to genocide in a single case. They actually acquitted on the conspiracy to genocide charge because it can't be proved that there was a conspiracy to commit genocide in Rwanda in 1994 by the Hutu government of Habyarimana. It cannot be proved because it did not happen. It was not planned and organized. It was fabricated. It was, we were conditioned to think there was a genocide that began in 1992. There was killing. There were acts of genocide where a Hutu person picked up a machete and killed his Tutsi neighbor. But there were also Tutsis. Sorry. But there were also Tutsis doing the killing, and they were called the RPF. The ugly reality in Rwanda was that more people were Hutus who were killed. The Kagame government, the Kagame military machine needed bodies, and it created those bodies in all kinds of different ways. But better than bodies are skeletons because they can't tell the story. So people who go to Rwanda today and see these genocide memorials, just like the Pol Pot memorials in Cambodia, the Pol Pot memorials of skeletons in Cambodia are skeletons that were, were people killed by the U.S. bombing campaigns, not just by the Khmer Rouge. There was a decade and a half of genocide in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, which is never discussed, except today by Ed Herman and sometimes Noam Chomsky, many times Noam Chomsky, but Ed Herman has, has written a book called The Politics of Genocide. And in Rwanda, all these skeletons that were, that are just, they, they create these skeletons, they put them in a memorial, they say those are the Tutsis that were killed by the Hutus, and you say anything about it and I'm going to accuse you of genocide denial, which is exactly what the government of Rwanda has done with me. So, in rea ugly reality in Rwanda, but what's for sale in this full page New York Times story? Who owns Saks Fifth Avenue? If you read the story and believe it, which most Americans did if they read it, 
it's savagery, it's African, it's, we can't do anything about it. Gosh, I wish Bill Clinton would stop the killing in Rwanda, but he doesn't know what's going on. Anyway, I need to shop for my wife. <clears throat> Sex, sexual, subliminal sexuality is big in media and advertising. I mean, you know, I, I, it's a thesis in and of itself. It's a whole lecture. You, you could talk about it on and on. In Rwanda, a few Catholics were killed in the crossfire. No, they weren't. They were butchered by the Kagame machine because the Catholics supported the Javier, they supported the Hutus in the revolution of 1959. They supported the Javier Mana government. The Catholics were actually very honest in helping Tutsi and Hutu refugees. And because of that, because they spoke out against the RPF, they were killed. The Spanish priests who were killed in Rwanda were created, spawned the investigations by Spain, who has, at this, at this point, delivered 40 indictments against the top RPF officials for genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity in Rwanda and the Congo. These indictments should be served on Paul Kagame. And the French indictments should be served on Paul Kagame. But instead, Kagame and Museveni, both of them should be served, are still in power, still committing atrocities. And that's why we've got over 10, 12 million people dead in the Congo. And people still being disappeared in Rwanda. And if you work in Rwanda, you need to understand this. If you stand up and say anything about it, like a woman from Mount Hoyoke or Hampshire College who was working there, a professor, and she said something about it one day, and that was the end of her career in Rwanda. Davenport and Stan, these two professors, when they came, started coming closer to the truth, the Rwandan military started stepping in their way. The more the military stepped in the way of these two arrogant American professors who think they can do anything in the world, the more they pushed for the truth. And the more they pushed for the truth, the more the military came down on them until finally they were arrested and deported and can no longer go to Rwanda. So what is that? I'm sorry, we're talking about Rwanda and Catholics. I'm sorry, what is that? Is it a... What? Is it a... Is it male or female in genitalia? I mean, come on, do you see any resemblances? Is it an accident? Is it a perfume bottle? Of course, it's just, they're just selling perfume next to the Rwandan savagery. Okay, so Kigali clerics fear refugees have been killed, right. Right, they fear refugees have been killed, right. Right, 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 right. Modern means staying cool, calm, and directed, folks. Don't worry about those savages in Africa. Let's take off our clothes and have a little sex and sell some products here. What's for sale in this advertisement? The New York Times is, a, is an advertising delivery mechanism. It's not a news delivery mechanism. It's a corporation. It has a product. The product is selling information, but more importantly, it wouldn't exist without advertising. Newsweek, uh, 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 